Hi, I'm Larry Gostin. I'm a, a professor of global health law at Georgetown University and director of the World Health Organization Center on Global Health Law. And I'm really delighted to be here um, to talk about the intersection of health and human rights. Um, many years ago, uh, when I was quite young, um, I had a very close relationship with uh, the late Jonathan Mann. Now, many of you, particularly if you're young, might not know Jonathan, but he was the first um, leader of World Health Organization's global program on AIDS. But more importantly, he's commonly thought of as the father of health and human rights. And we taught at Harvard the very first class, we believe, in the world um, on health and human rights. Uh, John and I had an article in the first issue of the Journal of Health and Human Rights, um, which talked about the intersections between these two fields. And our point was simple. Um, we said that um, in order to have um, uh, public health, you needed to have human rights. In order to have human rights, you need to have public health. And that both public health and human rights are thoroughly interconnected. There was no tension between them, um, but they were both um, necessary and important. Um, but that was many, many decades ago. And now we're here in the midst of a once in a century pandemic. Um, a, a tiny little microorganism um, in probably in Wuhan, China, um, in some time early December 2019, made a zoonotic leap um, from a bat to an intermediary animal and then to a human. And this little microscopic organism uh, went on to literally control the entire world. Um, it controlled all of our lives and it gave free reign to political leaders either for good or for bad to promote public health or to deny it, um, to promote human rights or to deny it. Um, it's often said that pandemics like COVID-19 um, are reflections on who we are. Um, and we're currently searching for who we actually are as a people, not just here in the United States, um, but globally, everywhere, um, where we're trying to figure out how much we can open our economies, how much we focus on COVID, and how much we are willing to deny people their right to health and their other rights. Um, COVID-19 has had profound implications. First of all, um, it has completely um, uh, changed the dynamic of uh, the right to health. Um, we see um, that we're all vulnerable, but particularly um, the poor, um, uh, essential workers, and others are very vulnerable and most vulnerable. In the United States, for example, uh, COVID-19 has uh, created infections and deaths at the rate of four times that of for non-Hispanic whites. Um, and so this is a disease of color it's a disease of poverty, um, and it's something that has captured all of us. When I uh, was asked by the CDC um, after 9-11 and the anthrax attacks um, to write the Model Emergency Health Powers Act, I anticipated much of what we've seen with COVID-19. I anticipated you know, testing, tracing, isolation, quarantine. But I could never have imagined that the size of a city of, like Wuhan, Beijing, New York, London, Paris, Delhi um, would be locked down. At one point in the epidemic, uh, fully one third of all of humanity was in total lockdown. Uh, we've also seen um, uh, travel restrictions like never before. Uh, we've seen digital tracing apps, um, some voluntary, but many compulsory, um, like in China. 
In China, we've seen, um, you know, police and law enforcement and deep state surveillance. Um, they've done a very good job with with stemming the COVID-19 pandemic, but at what cost to human rights? And so what I want to discuss here today um, are essentially three important uh, human rights values. Uh, the first one is the right to health. The second is the right to freedom and civil liberties and civil rights. And the third is the right to equity and justice. So the right to health, um, what is it? Um, you know, in one sense, it's just you know, a rhetorical tool of advocacy. We have the right to health. Um, social movements claim this all over the world and with good justification because your health means everything. But beyond that, um, it has a legal significance. The right to health is contained in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and also in the International Covenant of Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights. It is also in, seen in so many different treaties, from treaties on the rights of women, on the rights of children, on the rights of persons with disabilities. In fact, every country in the world has signed and ratified at least one international treaty recognizing the right to health, including the United States. In addition, the right to health is found in over a hundred constitutions uh, the world over. It might be specifically the right to health, or in the case of say India, uh, it might be the right to life, which the Supreme Court of India has found to include the right to health. Uh, it include the right to environment, but many courts around the world from South Africa to India to Brazil recognize the right to health. The United States does not have a right to health in its constitution, and the Supreme Court has never said there's the affirmative right to health. Um, the Supreme Court sees it as a negative constitution, what government may not do, but not what government must do um, to include and safeguard our health and our safety, which is the most important thing uh, that we possess as a people. Um, and so the right to health is critically important. Um, it's internationally recognized. And even in the United States, while it's not in our constitution, we have ratified treaties on the right to health. And so the right to health means that everybody has the right to universal health coverage. Um, so we all have access to health care, that there are strong and resilient public health systems to prevent disease, injury, um, and uh, to promote health. These things are critically important. And they're important because our health means everything. And so many of the foundations of our other civil rights and liberties and all of our hopes and dreams and aspirations depend upon a fair shot at us having health. The right to health doesn't guarantee we will be healthy, but the right to health does tell us that we all have a fair shot at access to health. And that includes health care and public health, but it also includes the deeper socioeconomic determinants of health, like housing, um, poverty alleviation, education, women's empowerment, and many other areas. A second area that I want to cover is our civil liberties, you know, the right to freedom, uh, to autonomy, to privacy. You know, as I've said during COVID-19, we've seen all of these diminish. And we've seen these diminish in ways that can be alarming. The United Nations has even formed a special commission on COVID and human rights, as dictators around the world have used this as an excuse to invade um, uh, people's uh, civil rights and civil liberties. Now, under international law, there's something called the Siracusa Principles. I was very proud that as a very young man, I was part of the drafting committee for the Siracusa Principles uh, in Italy. And it was really an exciting time. But these principles 
tell us the kinds of interference with human rights and civil liberties that are allowable in a public health emergency. Well, these deprivations of liberty are only allowable if first they are evidence-based. That is, do they, does the intervention actually achieve an important safeguard for public health and safety? But secondly, is it the least restrictive alternative? That is, are there less restrictive or draconian alternatives that can achieve the public health objective as well or better? And it also needs to be proportionate, to proportionate to the to the benefit that we will have. Um, and there needs to be fair processes, due process of law, natural justice. All of these things are critically important under the Syracuse principles. And then the third area I want to talk about is equity and justice. You know, on the Georgetown Law Library, there's we have a sign, and the sign says, law is but the means, justice is the end. And that's true. Um, we have laws and we have the rule of law to serve justice and equity. And my belief is, is that even before COVID-19, the prevailing narrative in the world was a narrative in, of inequity and injustice. Martin Luther King once famously said that all inequalities are unjust, but the greatest injustice are health inequalities. And he's right. Health inequalities are horrible. It's unconscionable that somebody of color um, or somebody who's poor or because of their sex or gender um, suffer disease, injury, or death at greater rates than others. Um, this is just simply unfair. And even basic things like cancer, heart disease, infectious diseases, these should be equally distributed among the population biologically, but all of these diseases are socially constructed and they always seem to hit the poor, um, the disadvantaged, much more than others, including persons with disabilities. Um, we've seen this with tuberculosis, AIDS, and certainly um, with uh, COVID-19 and other epidemic diseases. So we are now roughly midway through the COVID-19 pandemic, and we're about to try to get um, new therapeutics and innovative vaccines. But how will we equitably distribute those vaccines? How will we do it in the United States? Will we give priority to scarce vaccines to those who are have been most affected by COVID-19? Um, people of color, Blacks, um, uh, Hispanic, Latinx populations, um, and uh, Native Americans? Um, will we give it to essential workers who've had to risk their lives every day? You know, COVID-19 is, you know, we often say we're in this together, and we are, but people also suffer so disproportionately. It's fine um, that if you're uh, isolated or locked down at home, so long as you can work remotely and have a steady income, you have a stocked fridge and cupboard and, is, and, and, and are doing well um, with internet access. But if you don't have all of these things, you will suffer and many of you will die. And that's just awfully unfair and unjust. Uh, and so equity is critically important, not just in the United States, but globally. The World Health Organization um, has a, a facility called the COVAX facility designed to buy up uh, vaccines and distribute them affordably to all low-income countries in the world. But the rich countries, the United States, Canada, the European Union, China, and others, have bought up most of the existing supplies of vaccines. Vaccine nationalism is not equality. It's not justice. It's not about who we are as a nation in terms of mutual solidarity. 
The United States is not even a member of COVAX, while China is. So I really want to conclude by, you know, saying again that, you know, infectious disease and pandemics are kind of a, a mirror. They're a reflection of who we are. And right now we have two paths. Um, we can take the paths of nationalism, nationalism, populism, me first, my people first, my nation first, or we can realize this is something that we all have to solve together as a collective good, that we have to follow the common good. It's not just about me, it's about the we. And that we need to stop asking the question, you know, what can everybody do for me? But what can I do for my neighbor, my country, and also the world? And so we do have two paths. We can take the path of nationalism and populism and me first, or we can take the path of human rights, the rule of law, justice and equity, um, and the common good, uh, realizing that no one's safe in this world unless we're all safe. And also realizing that, you know, while we deserve the goods of treatments and vaccines, every human life on this planet has equal worth and is equally deserving. All of us, wherever we live, whatever our gender, whatever our income or status or religion, you know, we all have the same dreams and aspirations, and we all have a fair shot at, should have a fair shot at um, health, vitality, um, and a good life. And so that, in a snapshot, is what's at stake. Health and human rights are critically important in all times, but most of all, in these times when we're all under such stress and such risk. Thank you very much. Um, and I hope that you will fight from the bottom up and from the top down um, for the right to health for all and the right to justice. Take care. Bye.